So, yeah, let me just say a few words of introduction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Milton Keynes Literature Festival. Uh, the view, I'm, I'm in, in Zoom at the moment. I can only see four of you at a time, but I know several very familiar faces are here, and it will be lovely to see you when I get them to scroll through and actually look at your, your lovely faces in person. Uh, this Hi, evening, yeah. I'm delighted that we're joined by the lovely Gwen Taylor, uh, for an event that I've been suggesting that we have at Fest for a couple of years now, which is a session on songwriting, because I've always reckoned that songwriting is a form of creative writing that literature festivals tend to completely ignore. So this is our attempt to, to, to start putting that right. Uh, for those of you that don't know her, I know Gwen's going to introduce herself, but she is front person, songwriter, singer, multi-instrumentalist for the wonderful Gwen and The Good Thing, who you should all go off and look up on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and TikTok, or am I ahead of myself there? Mm, no, maybe not, not TikTok. <laughs> don't know TikTok does it. Maybe next week. Uh, and you can discover their music. Oh, and Spotify. And you can discover their music and their very clever videos all for yourself. Um, <coughs> Gwen is going to deliver this as a masterclass. I know she has a whole presentation to give to you. So just sit back and, and discover how Gwen goes about the, the mysterious alchemy that is songwriting. By all means, uh, Gwen will take your questions at the end of the session. If you have a question that occurs to you as the, the event is taking place, stick it in the chat window because John and I will be monitoring that the whole way through and we'll come to as many of you as we can at the end of the event so that you can ask Gwen your question in person. Uh, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. Oh, one thing, um, one yeah. thing that, um, first of all, we are encouraging everybody who wants to, to show their smiling faces. So Gwen has got an audience of smiling faces to look at rather than a, a sea of, of uh, typography. Uh, and secondly, we are uh, recording this and we will, subject to Gwen's agreement with whatever it looks like when we've got it, uh, we will be putting it up on the website as we have with other performances. So uh, that's the, uh, a very good reason for keeping your uh, video off if you really don't want anybody to associate you with this event. Um, otherwise, do associate yourself with this event because it's going to be good. Uh, back to you, Dave. And, and your lockdown hair can't possibly be more shameful than mine. So, yeah. <laughs> Bear this in mind. On, on that note, let me hand over to Gwen to deliver a masterclass on songwriting. Thank Take you it very away, much. Gwen. You're very welcome. Hi, everybody. I hope you guys are all uh, doing okay. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much to MK Lit First for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's an honor. I was very flattered. Um, I don't often talk very much about my own songwriting. Um, I am a typical British person and find it quite difficult to talk about myself um, <laughs> and I'm not very good at the whole self-promotion, talking myself up kind of thing. So uh, I am very passionate about talking about songwriting in general though um, and uh, I found this really difficult to put together mostly because I ended up going down so many different tangents and different rabbit holes and falling down different things that I found interesting and things I wanted to talk about. And I was like, oh my God, this is never going to fit into 45 minutes to an hour. This is crazy. Um, so I've tried to make this uh, masterclass, in inverted commas, um, purely about my approach to songwriting because trying to tackle the whole myriad of things that you could talk about to do with songwriting was... Um, possibly impossible. So this is very much going to be about my approach. I'm going to talk a bit about um, breaking down uh, my songwriting process and hopefully um, also give you guys some helpful tips um, for your own songwriting. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, uh, let me just uh, go on to the next slide. I think this video will pretty much tell you everything that you need to know about me. So, uh, yeah, if you're wondering about my songwriting style or who I am as a musician or who I am as a songwriter, I feel like that video pretty much sums it up. We can probably just leave it there. See you guys later. Bye. Um, yeah, so this is me on the eve of my fourth birthday wearing a nappy 
possibly. I don't really know. Could be some pants. I'm rocking a really cool haircut. I should probably go back to that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a bit of an insight into how I was raised. Um, I had a very extremely musical and multi-talented Welsh mother who uh, was not a necessarily a songwriter herself, but she was a wonderful singer <coughs> and instrumentalist, and she did compose music and arrange music. Um, she was definitely a writer of sorts. Um, she wrote some poetry and um, she had an amazing turn of phrase and I miss her very much. Um, so that's kind of how I grew up with her blasting out um, pretty much anything from anything and everything from Led Zeppelin and Thin Lizzy to Monteverdi and Eric Whittaker on a Saturday morning on the stereo. And uh, yeah, um, I still write using her guitar, which is over there, and her piano, which is behind me and also in the video. Um, so that's kind of a bit of my musical inheritance, really. That's what I'm made up of. Um, and I guess I kind of come to songwriting from a fairly academic music background. So um, I have a music degree. I studied music and Italian um, at university where I did a bit of paper composition, um, a bit of studio composition, which is basically recording weird noises and chopping them up and doing weird things with them. Um, uh, using electronic stuff. I'm not going to go into that anymore now. Um, and um, basically most of my memories of university just revolve around listening to and playing a massive variety of music, um, classical, jazz, all sorts of weird stuff, um, and drinking. And I don't remember producing a lot of work, but it was good. And then after graduating, um, I worked, I actually worked as a stage manager, stage and events manager, um, mostly in opera and, and um, festivals and did a bit of um, touring in the UK and internationally. Um, but even though I loved it very, very much, I decided I did that for about five or six years. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to spend more time focusing on my own creative practice rather than sort of facilitating other people's creative practice. So I stopped doing that. And then um, I mostly just do teaching now as well as writing music. Um, although I did dabble a little bit, I do dabble a bit more in, in stage management every now and again. Um, and I did a Ravi Shankar opera with London Philharmonic Orchestra last year, which was really interesting. If you haven't ever heard Ravi Shankar's opera, it's quite something. So uh, yeah, anyway, it sounds kind of cheesy, but as the video might suggest, I feel like I've kind of always written songs of some description. Um, when I was nine, my first band was called The Glitter Girls, and we were heavily influenced by 90s girl power, The Spice Girls, and um, Hating Our Brothers. And um, as you can see, this was our, uh, this was our first uh, bit of published work. I hope you guys can relate to that. Um, it's pretty strong. Um, <laughs> so uh, I started recording music properly and kind of playing music with bands um, as a teenager um, and even played sax in a ska punk band. That was an interesting moment. Um, <laughs> but I didn't really start kind of taking commercial or pop songwriting um, seriously until I started collaborating with um, Chris Norrish, who some of you might know, um, who is the better half of Gwen and the Good Thing. Um, and he uh, studied popular music at Leeds College of Music. And I really found when we first met and started writing together and collaborating on stuff, I found his attitude and knowledge around kind of the area of commercial songwriting so insightful. So obviously my background was very much in sort of classical music, having done kind of a classical music degree. Um, and I've always kind of written pop songs, but my attitude towards writing pop songs wasn't really as, I wasn't as serious about it as potentially, you know, composing high-minded classical music, rah, 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 rah. Um, but I always found that Chris's attitude towards composing kind of popular music so interesting because he really inspired me to push myself further with my own 
writing to refine things further um, to work harder on those ideas and to also just accept feedback and criticism because I think a lot of the people who I had previously collaborated with writing kind of popular music were very much like this is my heart's truth and no one shall pass judgment on it and this is it and if you don't like it well you just don't have any taste and so that was kind of where my songwriting was coming from and he kind of taught me to think actually no you can take criticism you can improve this this can be refined in the same way that when i was studying you know paper composition at university you would be criticized and you would refine your work so he kind of showed me that um songwriting and popular music songwriting which is what i do now um is a craft and it is something that you can you can hone and it can be improved rather than just something that you're either good at or you're not. Like you don't just have to be born being able to compose interesting um, songs. So um, together, Chris and I have collaborated um, with some amazing musicians who we've gigged with as um, Gwen and the Good Thing, which is our band name, um, including um, very talented guitarists and producers, Kit Keenly Side and Nathan Parker, um, with whom we still continue to create and release music now um so yeah uh this is us this is going to the good thing we've played at various festivals including glastonbury um <laughs> i can die happy now um and we've been very much supported by like the local bbc introducing radio show who've put us onto stages at festivals on a number of occasions um and we have uh, recorded and released a bunch of different songs. So if you have Spotify or uh, Apple Music or YouTube or any streaming service, or if you would like to go and buy them from iTunes, that's also possible, and Amazon Music and stuff like that, um, please feel free to check out our catalogue. I'm quite proud of it. It's quite hard for me to say things like that. So I hope you appreciate <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, this is uh, my kind of songwriting background. Um, and today I want to talk you through what my songwriting process involves. So there's kind of two different strands um, to my usual kind of songwriting process. So either, strand A, I would come up with a concept from scratch, write a melodic idea, harmonize them, harmonize the melody, decide on key, tempo style, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that will be kind of coming up with something from scratch. On the other hand, another way that I currently write is by top lining, this is kind of a weird phrase, top lining a pre-existing track or a beat or a chord progression that somebody else has written. So they're kind of two different ways of thinking. Um, you might think of it just as either you've written the music or you haven't written the music basically so some of the time i will write everything as a complete creation including the music including the chords including you know how i want it to sound the style the arrangement and then some of the time somebody else will maybe even have completed a fully fledged track but it just doesn't have a melody line it doesn't have any lyrics so i'll come and top line it so that's what it's called top lining it's basically writing a melody and lyrics over the top of somebody else's music so the first thing that i want to talk about today is the first strand so the method where i will literally come up with an idea from scratch um, and then develop that into a fully fledged song so um yeah uh i will start off every song that i write You're on mute, Gwen. Gwen, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Something happened. I don't know what. 
Um, so all of my songs will start with an initial concept. Um, that could be just like a word, a phrase, a mood, a feeling, an idea. It could be a person, real or fictional. It could be a memory. It could be a dream. This is just literally the most fragmented start that you could possibly imagine. So it could just be that I'll just be walking along somewhere and something will come into my mind and I'll think, oh, that'd be a great thing to base a song around. Or I'll just be, you know, driving. In fact, my next my next uh, slide was going to be places that I like to come up with ideas. So usually my best ideas come when I'm driving or if I'm walking or if I'm showering or anything where usually it's when your brain is being occupied by something else. If you're doing something else, it kind of, there's probably some really scientific explanation for this, but it frees up part of your brain to do some other magical thing. So a lot of the time I'll get an idea when I'm just, I don't know, driving the car, focusing on something else, and I'll kind of, something will come into my mind. And um, this is usually the kind of gem, the germ of um, most of these kind of songs that I would write. Um, the next phase, after I've come up with a little idea, is that I will record it. So <laughs> this is where it starts to get a bit cringe for me. So I'm going to share with you guys, I hope you're appreciating how much I'm laying myself bare here but i'm going to share some voice notes with you today so this is literally from my phone uh <laughs> this is me sitting in my car after i've just driven back from somewhere i can't actually remember where or when this was recorded but i found it recently so i thought it was a good example um and i'll have been singing something as i'm driving along and i'll stop the car and i will uh i will record it so hopefully this will play here we go. It's so strange the way I love the things you do and say. But will I ever even know the person behind the shadows you make? Okay, so. <laughs> that's literally just me having driven along thought of some random melody line some random words and I'll record it and I might forget about it and I might come back to it um so the next thing is that I will hopefully if I've come up with something that I'm interested in that I'll work on developing that initial concept so I might start thinking about the first phase is very much just free-flowing I don't tend to put any kind of barriers on myself. I don't question what I'm doing. I don't restrict myself. I don't, you know, um, criticize. I try not to self-criticize at that point. But then after I've kind of recorded that initial idea, I'll start thinking about developing and refining. So I'll maybe ask myself, okay, well, based on that idea, that little bit that you've just recorded, what kind of style of song do you think that that would be, that that might turn into in what direction does that initial concept take you musically does it sound like something um that might have a natural melodic line that would fit that idea like this particular one that i just played you i had come up with a melody and the words at the same time but that doesn't always happen it might be that i kind of come up with some words and then i might think about what melodic line might naturally fit those words or it might be the other way around i might just come up with a melody and then later on think of some words that might fit with the melody. In this case, as probably happens the majority of the time, I'll kind of think of a melody and the words at the same time. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about how uh, this is kind of the difference between maybe poetry and songwriting is that the sound of the words tends to play into the melody line or the melody line tends to play into the sound of the words. I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that later. Is there a kind of mood or atmosphere that I'm trying to evoke? I'll kind of question myself at this point. Are there any kind of reference tracks that relate to the concept? So if I've kind of come up with a, a little idea of something, I'll be like, oh, does this remind me of a particular song by somebody else? It's not copying someone to think, does this remind me some of something that I really love? And if it does, maybe I'll go and listen to that artist because we'll talk a bit more about um, interrogating other people's work later but it's not 
copying people to start thinking about how you yourself are made up as an artist by different influences. So are there any reference tracks that relate to that concept? Are there any other tracks that maybe I'm trying to go down that similar pathway? So that will be kind of the next thing that I'll start to think about. So the next thing, the next voice note, embarrassing voice note I'm going to share with you is me taking the idea that I had recorded in my car and me trying to harmonize this. So I've, I've played some chords on the piano. I've said to myself, okay, this kind of sounds like a kind of jazzy idea. Maybe I'll, and it's got this kind of descending melody line. So na, 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 da, 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 da. So I've played some descending kind of jazzy chords. I'm not going to talk loads about um, music theory with you guys today, because that would be like a whole extra session. But that's what I've done anyway. So let's have a little listen to what I did. This is me messing around on this piano. It's so So that's just me literally improvising on a chord progression. There's a lot of da 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 da's, la 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 la's that goes on because at this point I haven't actually written any proper lyrics to go with it. Um, so I'm just working around that initial idea and messing around. Again, it's not particularly refined at that point, um, but I'm just letting that kind of imaginative part of my brain just go and. Um, being fairly relaxed about it. Um, so the next phase is that I would start to think about the chorus. I would always start a song with the chorus. So even if I've come up with a maybe an idea or a little, little bit of a melody that feels like a verse melody, I will start to think, okay, well, what is the hook of this song going to be? I need to refine the core concept and try to work that into a memorable phrase. So if you think about every song you've ever loved and has stuck in your mind, I can guarantee that it is because the chorus is incredible. The best songs have the, are the ones that have the strongest choruses. Um, as somebody, <laughs> as someone who, you know, I'm obviously like very into a lot of different styles of music but if you think about pop music specifically which is the style of music that i write most of the time you wouldn't ever have a verse that is stronger than a chorus so whenever i'm writing a song i will always start with the chorus we don't want even if you have an incredible verse it it should never be stronger than your chorus so start by thinking about refining, as I was saying, refining the core concept of your song, whatever it is that you're trying to communicate, this little idea, this little germ of an idea that you maybe had when you were driving in your car or having a bath or whatever it is. And you want to base, you want to con consolidate that and concentrate that into a memorable phrase, something that communicates the essence of what your song is about. And you want to try and keep it, I try to keep my choruses as simple as possible, at least to begin with. You don't want to try and fit too much into your chorus. It needs to be that kind of consolidated, distilled essence of whatever your song is about. Um, and that will then become the jumping off point for whatever the rest of, however the rest of my song will develop. So just um, think about how you can distill that idea into a chorus. Um, when I say simple, what I mean by that is not have, making it too wordy. And I also feel like melodically not making it too complicated. You don't want a chorus that's going to be particularly um, melodically complex. It doesn't want to be kind of lots of scales going up and down. You want to maybe restrict it even to simple, maybe even 
one or two, three notes, something that's going to be fairly straightforward, something that is going to stick in people's minds, something that people can sing along with. These are the kind of things that I would think about when I'm writing what you might call like a commercially viable pop song anyway. Um, clearly that's not going to be relevant for every genre. Um, again, I'm talking about my own personal style of writing. So take what you will from that anyway. Um, the next thing that I would think about with my songwriting is, is structure and balance. So I'm thinking about that on the micro and the macro scale. So when I say structure and balance, I mean, if you're writing a line, even if that's just, you know, one line of a verse, you want to make sure that you're balancing um, complexity and simplicity. Same thing for overall structure. So that's why I say micro and macro. If you're thinking about a song as a whole, you don't want um, to have really, really dense, complicated verse, really, really dense, complicated pre-chorus, really, really dense, complicated chorus. You want to maybe have a simple chorus, a verse that is slightly more detailed, a verse that gives more depth and meaning to the song. But it doesn't make any sense if you have that throughout the whole song you need to have that balance that yin and yang and it's the same thing even within a verse like i would always work to this idea that you would maybe have two shorter lines in a verse followed by maybe a longer line followed by a shorter line if you listen to um most of the songs that i've written if you care to go and listen through a lot of the time that is the way that i would structure a verse so it'll often be like short line short line long line short line so that you've got that kind of balance um yeah it's all just about it's to i mean it's all probably to do with like the golden ratio and things that are very complicated in art and things that i don't really understand but we as humans we like that beginning middle and end we like that structure we like that golden ratio and it's something that people probably do it naturally but if you think about it if you stop and think about it while you're writing sometimes it can make you question what you're doing in a positive way. So maybe I want to make that third line of that verse slightly more interesting and slightly more complex rhythmically so that it balances out with the first line or balances out with the last line. Um, the next thing that I would maybe think about is, am I trying to fit within a specific radio ready mold? Again, this is very much more applicable to the style of music that I write. Most of the songs that I'm writing, I'm aiming towards things like Spotify playlists, towards radio. So they don't want anything that is over three and a half minutes. So when I'm writing a song, I'm trying to think about condensing my, and this is this this is, doesn't need to be a restrictive thing. It doesn't need to be something that everyone thinks, oh, this is gonna ruin creativity because actually, restrictions are what creates the best art. So if you're trying to fit your idea and your concept into three and a half minutes, then you need to do that in the most effective and most efficient way possible. Just kind of going on. And there's, there's obviously space for things that ramble and go down interesting alleyways. And, you know, that's not to say that that's not good songwriting. But I think if you can distill your ideas into three and a half minutes, then that's probably a good thing. So that's not going to apply to everybody, but that's something that I think about when I'm writing music. And going back to this idea of the chorus and the hook. So when I say the hook, I'm talking about the bit that gets stuck in your head. And as a songwriter, you always want to be thinking about what is the strongest part of this song? What is the hook? What is the bit that is going to get stuck in your head? So whatever you do in terms of structuring your song should serve that hook or that chorus. So like I was saying before, um, if I'm aiming towards radio, I want to maybe start my song with a hook because otherwise people turn it off or they skip onto the next track. That's just a reality. So we're dealing with short attention spans. So you might want to start with a hook. You might want to start with something that is going to engage people's attention. Um, or you might structure your song so that you get back to the hook quicker. I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, when we go through an example of a song, oh God, I can't believe we're already 36 minutes past seven. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go through an example of a song that I've written and there's, a, there's going to be a point where I have cut something so that we get back to the chorus faster. So that's another thing that you might wanna think about when you're structuring and balancing your song so that it all serves that hook, it serves that chorus. That needs to be the most important part of the song. Okay, right. 
And then the next thing that I will think about is getting feedback. And this goes back to what I was saying about initially collaborating with different people. So being an artist isn't always about going, okay, I'm a delicate flower and my ideas are wonderful and I just need to be have the space to create and not be questioned. You need to get some feedback on what you've done because it's going to help you to refine it further and be better. And you don't always want to look for blindly positive feedback. So don't always just send it to your mum or whoever's going to just say, yeah, that's great. I love you for who you are. You want to send it to somebody who's going to give you constructive feedback and say, do you know what? Actually, I think you've done better before. I think you've actually written something stronger in the past and I think you could do better. Or I really liked the thing you did in the second half of the song, but maybe you could move that a bit further forward so that we get to that earlier. Um, and it doesn't need to come from a fellow musician or a songwriter. It can come from anybody. It can come from, yeah, anyone. It, it, someone who doesn't come from like that background is probably going to be better anyway because they're going to have that raw visceral gut reaction to your music without going oh i think it's really clever the way that you did this because actually i could see that you use this chord progression and blah, 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 blah. so you might want to actually get feedback from somebody who is not from a musical background so these are the things that i think about anyway when i'm writing this is kind of my process so the song that i wanted to kind of go through with you guys today is um a, a song called losing track which um was written between 2019 2020 it was released in 2020 and um, it's released last year during lockdown um it was written by kit chris nathan and gwen of gwen and the good thing uh all of the obviously the lyrics melody and stuff is written by me and then um other instrumental parts and the arrangement um was put together by um kit chris and nathan um I suppose I better play it to you if you haven't heard it before. This is how it goes. Sipping a drink slow, watching the clouds go. Reflecting your eyes, watching paradise reflect in your eyes, watching paradise reflect in your eyes, watching paradise reflect in your eyes. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. 
sitting through that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, so yeah, this song was, uh, the initial concept for this song uh, came from a kind of, I guess like a mood, a feeling, an atmosphere of warmth, escapism, letting go of past or future, focusing on the beauty of the present moment, um, the way that you feel during a long hot summer, slowing down and appreciating the small things like a cold beer or watching the seasons change day by day. So these were all the kind of things that I was thinking about um, when I was writing this song, um, presumably during the summer. Um, and I wanted to kind of consolidate that feeling into uh, a song, into a particular hook. Um, the way that this song initially came about was with a little first sketch. So again, this is very embarrassing. I hate sharing this kind of stuff. <laughs> so this is me just noodling around on the piano. Please enjoy. <laughs> Sipping our drinks slow Watching the clouds go Everything we've got so goddamn beautiful And that's why everything is under control that's why everything is under control Yeah, you know everything is under control Yeah, we know everything is under control So yeah, there's a lot of rambly stuff going on there. Um, <laughs> uh, but you can kind of hear from that that I'm just playing around with this kind of general idea. And from that, just mucking around, I kind of settled on, there was a couple of bits that I felt were sort of hook worthy. So there's the bit in the verse where it goes, everything we've got so goddamn beautiful. So that was a bit that I kind of, when I was improvising on the piano, I was kind of like, oh, that feels like that could be a part that repeats, that could be a hook that comes back over and over again. The other part that I got from that little noodling around on the piano was the, so from just that mucking around on the piano, those were the bits that I felt would be kind of, I guess like the hooks of the song. So you can just improvise, just have a play around. If you're not a piano player, it doesn't really matter, whatever you can just, if you're not an instrumentalist, then this is kind of still something that you can do. You can collaborate with other people. If you come up with something that you think is kind of like a hooky melody idea, just record it. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about what I use to record things, but you don't need to be a pianist or a guitar player or anything to do this. You can just come up with things, mess around, record ideas into your phone or into your laptop, or whatever, and um, try and pick out the bits that you think feel like they're going to be the strongest that, that are going to stick in your head. Usual rule of thumb for me is that if I can't remember it in five minutes time, it's probably not worth remembering. So those were the bits from that initial improvisation that stuck in my head. And those were the bits that kind of carried on and solidified into a song. A lot of those lyrics didn't continue into the final version. <laughs> Some of them were a bit weird. So yeah, anyway, that's kind of the first sketch. So then the next step was identifying the hooks. Like I just said, there was a kind of verse, verse hook that I identified. There was a chorus hook that ended up in the final song. And then um, there's this kind of, we ended up doing this thing with the vocal sample, um, which is the bit that goes, ah, ah. I'll play it to you actually. It's in, oh, maybe it's in the next one. Here you go. Ah, ah. 
So that's a sample that Chris made from the uh, initial demo that I did from the chorus that ended up becoming a little hook that repeats at various points in the song. So that happens at the beginning. It happens at the start of the second verse. I think it comes back at the end. So those were kind of identifying the hooks of the song, the things that are going to be the most catchy. Then obviously choosing the chords. What is the harmonic pace just means like, how fast am I going to go through those chords? Is it going to be a kind of a <laughs> lots of held chords with lots of words over the top of each chord or are the chords going to move quite quickly through the song? Again, um, if you're interested in learning more about music theory and harmonic pace and harmonization, that's like a whole other thing. Um, but that's something that I would think about. Um, refining the chorus, obviously the chorus in that recording was not what ended up being the final chorus, but I took an idea from that and then worked with it. And then um, expanding out that verse idea. So obviously I had the, the idea of the sipping our drinks slow, watching the clouds go. And that was the initial melod um, lyrical idea that I had and melodic idea. And that ended up being kind of expanded out. And then obviously in terms of collaborating, I will have shown that to Chris and Chris will have gone, hey, let me mess around on a computer because I'm a talented producer and you're not. So anyway, yeah. Um, these were the lyrics is what they ended up being. Um, this maybe is a little bit of like, <laughs> this is the literary side of things. So <laughs> for MK Lit first, don't judge me, okay? This is not high-minded poetry. But this is an important point though. So in terms of literature, um, poetry and songwriting, these are what the words on paper often going to sound a bit naff if you just read it out loud okay it sounds really stupid sipping our drinks slow watching the clouds go everything we've got so goddamn beautiful doesn't i mean i don't know is that a poem I don't know, maybe but the way that it sounds with the the with the melody brings those vowels and makes them more than what they are on paper um the way that i repeat the lines so that it comes back that everything we've got so goddamn beautiful becomes a hook of the song. And I wanted to kind of play around with this idea of um, short, short, long, short, short, long. So again, that's what we were talking about before about kind of the balance of each of the sections. The other thing that I ended up doing was having this pre-chorus where it's the same line repeating over and over again. The reason that I wanted to do that was because I wanted to kind of evoke this feeling of when you're driving, and you're kind of watching this beautiful view with the street lights or with the trees just like going past over and over again. And you're sitting in the passenger seat and you're sitting looking at the person who's driving and maybe you're maybe they're wearing sunglasses and you're kind of seeing this view just like washing past over and over and over again. And that's why I wanted this kind of repetitive pre-chorus. So it's sort of, I don't know, a little bit hypnotic, I guess, but leading into the chorus is so basic. It's so, it's just this little idea again. It's this idea of having this really simple chorus idea. You and I, hours rushing by, you and I losing track of time. There's not really anything in there, but the whole thing is just expressing that one feeling that I had that I wanted to express in this chorus. So again, it's simple but I guess it just encapsulates what I wanted to express in this song. It's that feeling. And I hope it kind of communicates that in a pretty straightforward way. So again, commercial pop songwriting, just get this idea across whatever you're trying to communicate and hopefully other people will relate to what you're trying to say. Um, and then I guess the, the, the only other thing is that we then again have this middle section again with a very simple idea feet on the dash feet on the dash no looking back and then it repeats the the hook from the verse so it's just tying it all together it's like drawing a little thread between all of the sections so that it hopefully gets stuck in your head okay i don't really know what else to say about the lyrics i kind of like them it expresses how i felt at that time anyway so um, we talked about the vocal sample. 
we don't need to listen to that again. So I talked a bit earlier about refining and going through this kind of refining process. So I'll just play you a little bit here of how, um, this is from like a demo. So basically, the reason I wanted to play you that is because this was from a demo version and I ended up cutting that second half of the second verse. And the reason that I did that was going back to the thing that I was saying to you guys before about um, refining and making it all about that, that, that chorus hook, making the chorus the most important part of the song and serving the chorus, was that I felt that the, the, the song didn't need that extra time in between the two choruses. I wanted to get back to the chorus as quickly as possible. So I cut that extra, that second half of the verse so that the structure felt a bit more condensed. It it kind of balanced out a little bit nicer and it got back got us back to the chorus a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, it's just this idea of refining. You don't need to include all of the ideas that you come up with. They, they're not all necessary. You can cut the ones that you're not as passionate about. Um, I've included this screenshot just to show you. So I'm by no means a producer. Um, I work with somebody who's very, very, very good at it. And that's good. So always collaborate if you have things that you're not good at, work with other people. Um, but this is just to show you. So the, 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 the channels that are all colored orangey red, they're all of my vocal um, parts. So the next step that I will have gone through is to start layering up different vocal harmonies and create, this is kind of like my sort of, I guess, stereotypical sound is that I record lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of backing vocals and kind of stack them. So this is just to give you an insight into like what it looks like inside of the, <laughs> inside of the uh, logic file. So that will be the next phase in terms of my kind of creative process. Once I've come up with a song, once I've sketched it out, come up with like a demo version, refined it, I will then go through and add these kind of extra little details and harmonize it with various different bits going on, which hopefully you can hear in the final recording. Um, but I'm not going to bore you with any more about that now. And then finally, we made a little music video. So once we had you know, mixed it, mastered it, et cetera, et cetera, released it. We made a little music video. I'm not going to play you the whole thing. This is a little vibe. Yeah, so I'm not going to play the whole thing because um, <laughs> we don't have time. But it it's another way to kind of tie it all together. So once I'd kind of had this initial concept of this kind of thing about um, slowing things down, feeling, observing the passage of time, that then fed into the songwriting process, which then fed into this kind of creative process of making a video afterwards with all this kind of stop uh, time lapse video stuff um so it just kind of all came full circle with that kind of aspect of the creative process and that video was all just made at home there's nothing like expensive or create crazy going on there i guess the only thing that was tricky about it was editing all of the video clips together but um it was all shot just you know at home or, or in and around at home during lockdown last year so yeah that's kind of the construction of the song from start to finish. Um, we're kind of run a little bit running out of time. I don't know if uh, 
the moderators want to interrupt me at this point or whether I can <laughs> do any more chit chatting. Um, I, I was just going to say, I'm fine for time. Uh, okay. If you're happy to run over time, if any, if everybody else is, <clears throat> we're more than happy to 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 stay online. I'll let I, you finish whatever you were going to say. I'll, I'll just whiz. I'll whiz questions. through a couple of extra things. So, um, <laughs> for anybody who is interested in getting into songwriting, um, I'm just going to quickly talk through some of the things that I use. So, in terms of like tools and technology, as I said before, I'm by no means a music producer. I am very limited, have limited technological um, wherewithal. But the things that I use for my own songwriting, obviously I have stacks of notebooks. I'm trying to move away from paper notebooks a little bit because um, I find that it's just creating masses of paper that I don't want to keep in my life anymore. So I have this thing <laughs> called a rocket book. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but you can write on it and then what, what you can scan it and you can save it on your computer. I like writing with a pen. So rather than always writing, typing into my computer, I like to sometimes just free write with a pen. So this is kind of a compromise. So if you don't want to keep, if you like writing with a pen because it feels more creative to you than typing, but you don't want to keep creating stacks of notes, this is great because it's kind of like a compromise and you can just, when you filled it up, you can scan the things that you want to keep and then you can just wipe, wipe it clean with a wet cloth. So. It's kind of like my eco-friendly alternative to creating loads more notebooks of <laughs> lyrics. Um, also, phone. My phone is my best friend, so I basically just record voice notes. I'm sure every different kind of phone. This happens to be an iPhone. Other phones are available. It has like a free voice notes app, voice memos, I think it's called. So that is what I basically use whenever I come up with an idea, I will record it into the voice memos and then I will come back and review and I can just use that to then start working on an, on a song or an idea. Um, if you want to get into the production side of things, obviously there's so many different things that you can buy and use and it's a never ending rabbit hole of expensiveness. Um, but yeah, maybe having some kind of what they call a DAW. So this is uh, basically <laughs> where you create music on your computer. Um, on Macs, you obviously have things that are easy like GarageBand, but there are also other things available. Um, and then you can get into all sorts of other crazy things, but you need things such as interfaces and microphones and lots of other stuff. Um, but again, that's a whole other production-based masterclass. So those are the things I use. Anyway, critically listening. This is another important thing. Listening to other people's music critically. So not just listening to your favorite artists and going, oh, aren't they great? They're so good. But sit down and actually listen to what they're doing. Analyze what is great about that song. Is it the fact that I really love the, the lyrics? Or is it the fact that it's the way that they're singing them and the melody that I really love? Or is it the way that they've structured their song? Or is it just their voice that I love and I'm not really paying attention to what the song is doing? So, but critically listening, listening with a critical ear is really important because that is going to help you to improve your own songwriting. Um, sharing your ideas and collaborating. I already said about um, accepting criticism from people, but sharing your ideas and collaborating with others is so important in any kind of creative practice. And I think it's really important in songwriting. So those are kind of the most important things to me. And then finally, just embracing your own voice. Like you might not fit into any of these molds, but that doesn't mean you're not a good songwriter. You may not sound like any other artist, but that doesn't mean you're not good. And at the end of the day, songwriting should just be about expressing yourself and expressing what matters to you and enjoying the process. And I have to remind myself of that a lot of the time. And it can just be a cathartic experience. And if you want to just be like little baby Gwen and just smash a keyboard and make up some crazy words that don't make any sense, <laughs> then you just do that. And it's fine. It doesn't, you don't have to, you don't even have to share it with anybody. It can just be for you. But um, yeah, finding and embracing your own voice is important. Uh, okay. And then the final thing that I was going to suggest if I've got time was some yeah. things for other people to kickstart your own creativity. So a lot of the time I will hit a block, I will get writer's block and I don't know how to get out of it. Some of the things that I use are, um, 
just to kind of get get myself going are these things. So the first one is what I would call like the three step process. So the first step is to just sit down and um, write, just free write about a real event, just vividly describing it in two or three paragraphs. It does actually it doesn't even need to be a real event. It could be like a dream or something that happened to somebody else or something you heard about. Just sit down and write about an event, just vividly describing it. Talk about smell, sounds, things that you were wearing, tastes, it, as much cram as much detail, as much sensory information as you can into those three paragraphs and then leave it and come back the next day and turn it into like a poem, take take the most interesting bits out of it. And maybe when I say create a poem, you don't have to be a talented poet to do this. Just take the bits that seem the most interesting to you and maybe distill that into a couple of lines. And then the next day, come back and see if you can take that poem that you've created and turn it into a song. So try to add some melody to the things that you've written, maybe distill it even further, take maybe a couple of lines and do like I did with a really simple chorus. So that would be the first, my first idea. The other one is just like what I call a minute game. So just set yourself a timer and choose four words. It doesn't matter what they are, but just for the first word, just write about that word for five minutes. So if the word was like, I don't know, teeth, <laughs> write about teeth for five minutes just anything to do with teeth <laughs> just complete free flowing just write about that topic for five minutes and then take the second word and write about it for three minutes and then the third word and write about it for one minute and the last word write about it for about 30 seconds and then at the end just go back and circle any phrases that you found interesting or that looked like they might turn into something interesting so then you could take that and maybe develop it into a song and then the second, the third one is taking non lyrics and turning it into lyric. So that could be anything like look at the back of a carton of orange juice or something and look, I mean, maybe not a carton of orange juice. That's a bad example. Look at, take a book, like a nonfiction book or even a fiction book and just have a look at that and see if you can turn a couple of lines from that into a song just for fun. It could be something really silly, but it might, it might inspire you. And then the last one would be, um, oh no, sorry. I've got a couple more dismantling a song and reharmonizing it. So take somebody else's song and chop it up. So maybe take their melody and change the lyrics into something else. So I don't know, just take a really famous song and just completely change the lyrics. I tend to do that for fun anyway. Um, oh, can you still see my screen? And then yeah. the other way would be taking somebody else's words and reharmonizing them. So maybe mess if you play piano or keys or guitar or whatever, try taking a song and then just playing completely different chords underneath it. And again, it might give you some inspiration because then you could then write a new melody over the top of that. And then the final one would be song title creation. I actually do this quite a lot. So I set myself a timer and I just scribble different things, just free flowing ideas that come into my mind. So it could just be complete rubbish. I've got a few things on here, drop dead, lost myself, hard to change. Nothing's perfect. They're all just completely random, but I just have a go don't judge what you're writing and then have a look through and think, okay, well, could that maybe turn into a song? Maybe that's a song title. That could be quite good. Um, here's one, here's one I made earlier. So on here, there was one that I put, um, lost, uh, no, wait, where is it? Um, don't know why I just wrote, don't know why that's what I put as the title. Don't know why. So then this is a song idea that I kind of came up with off the back of that. So this is me just randomly noodling around I don't know why I can't look you in the eye don't know why I can't feel it when you smile I know I discover little secrets in your smile go back on <laughs> so that's me just noodling around that idea that little phrase and then this is like this is what it turned into in terms of like a demo on the computer if this works i don't know if this is gonna play well here we go oh no 
I'm failing technologically. This is just going to play both things at the same time, isn't it? Never mind. It didn't work. <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. It's it's just a way to kickstart your creativity. If you're struggling to think of something, you can just have a go at some of those ideas and see if anything sticks. Okay. Um, I think that's probably a reasonably good place to stop. The last thing I was going to talk about was this idea of songwriting being poetry, poetry being songwriting or not being poetry. But um, I think, again, that could maybe lead down another set of rabbit holes that we probably don't <laughs> have time for today. So um, maybe I'll just end on this quote uh, if I can get onto the next slide. Songwriting is not poetry. Songwriters are not poets or songs are not poems, I should say. In fact, songs are often bad poems. Take the music away and what you're left with is often an awkward piece of creative writing full of lumpy syllables, cheesy rhymes, exhausted cliches and mixed metaphors. Simon Armitage, 2008. Uh, do you agree? Personally, I don't agree. But no, I... that's his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is Simon Armitage anyway? Who the hell is Simon Armitage anyway? So, <laughs> poet, poet laureate, my ass. Uh, uh, exactly. Gwen, thank you. That has been amazing. Um, <laughs> I. It feels almost like an hour later. You've said us our homework, and and the the nineteen or twenty of us now have eleven months to write the UK's next yes, European entry. I can't wait. We have, we, we've got 48 weeks to come up with a banger, everybody. So <laughs> we'll get down to it. Um, we'll take people's <laughs> questions. And, oh, that's better. I can see everybody. That's, that's nicer. I was very struck listening to you. Um, I mean, we know each other, full disclosure. Uh, and, and Gwen knows that I have once in a while dabbled in songwriting, but I usually stick to just playing the guitar. Basically, because if I sing, I empty a room very quickly. Um, but I am a short story writer uh, and a poet, and I was struck by some kind of universal truths that carry across all of these forms, listening to you. And, and I was struck by some quotes by, by writers that I think apply to music just as much, or songwriting just as much as they do to stories or poetry. Uh, there's a, an American writer, George Sanders, who most of us have probably heard of, who made the point that in writing a short story, every sentence and every paragraph really has one job, which is to give enough momentum to get the, the reader or the listener onto the next sentence and paragraph, which is your point about get to the core of it as quickly. Don't, don't fill the song with, with lovely, clever ideas. Just bloody well get on with it, because that's actually what the listener has come here for. Um, and you you also talked about actually this is a craft deep feeling and and cathartic whatever is all <laughs> well hey we've got a cat <laughs> uh, but there is a skill here and there are, there are techniques and <laughs> the, the cat loves you bless him uh, so, I think my favourite quote about writing is from a, a, an English poet who emigrated to America called Tom Gunn, who just said, deep feeling doesn't make for great, great poetry. A bit of a way with language might help. <laughs> Apparently, he delivered in a creative writing class and, and horrified most of his students. But if you look at his writing, and I, I think if you look at a lot of good writing, it's not just emotional. There's a craft and a skill there which has helped the emotion get across. But it's not the emotion, it's not just the emotion that's made that point. Um, and the, uh, the other thing you made me think of was, if I don't remember this in five minutes, then junk that idea because it wasn't good enough. Uh, famously, that, that's the history of the whole title of, of one of Britain's most famous music programmes. It's, it's the Old Grey Whistle Test, if you know the, the story of why it was called that. If, yes. if the cleaners and the porters in the songwriting studio or the recording studio are humming the chorus the following morning or the milkman singing it back at you the following day, then it's a hit record. If they're not, wipe the tape and start again. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's exactly the point that you were, that you were making. Um, 
knuckle down to it and get on with it really is the is the lesson uh, but I, th I think we should take some some questions from our lovely audience uh, there was one from let me see she's still here susan holmes you had a question where several people in the chat went oh that's a good question so would you like to unmute yourself and ask it go on susie <laughs> Uh, we were wondering, how do you replicate the intricacies of the um, produced, recorded song into a live performance? That, oh, that is a good question. Percy thinks it's a good question too. Excuse me. <laughs> um, that is a really good point. Um, sometimes uh, they don't get translated into a live version. That's probably a fair, a fair assessment. I think. Um, we usually have like seven or eight of us on stage. So quite a lot of the time that solves a problem. Um, I think that there is something to be said for like a live version being different to a recorded version of a song. Um, uh, we do sometimes have, this is going to sound awful, but we do sometimes use backing tracks with some of our live performances, which is actually a very done thing now, especially in pop music. If you, if you go and see a band, or even rock music, if you go and see a band, they will probably have some stuff that is happening on the backing track, believe it or not. So sometimes we will put some of the synth stuff onto a backing track um, because it's just impossible for all of those parts to be happening played live unless you want to hire 10 musicians or something to do it. But um, hopefully that's answered that question. But yeah, live versions often are quite different to the recorded version. And I think that's a good thing, actually. I think you need that slightly different nuanced sound otherwise what's the point you might as well just listen to the recorded track and watch someone miming to it or something which is tends to be what happens anyway with a lot of live uh commercial performances or, or there are a lot of people off stage behind the speaker stacks playing yeah. the bits that you you can't quite see uh, yeah. a friend of mine spent many years touring as the piano player for the pretenders uh, you'll notice that there is never a piano on stage with the pretenders because none of the pretenders can actually play one <laughs> <laughs> there's a lovely gentleman called rupert who's made an absolute fortune being their piano player and he's never been seen by a single member of their audience he's, how weird he reckons he's, <laughs> he's played collectively to about two and a half million people now and not one of them have caught a glimpse of him <laughs> but that's where all the piano is coming from um, we had an we had another question that intrigued me from uh, Colin Lamond. You made a point in the wow. chat about rhyme schemes, Colin. Yeah, uh, it's, um, it's one of the things I noticed, and this actually was going to be my real point about uh, song lyrics are not poetry. I mean, they can be poetic, but they're not poetry. If, if you go to your favourite song and read the, the lyric in isolation, Sometimes it can seem like very, very poor, like literature. But with, with the magic of, of the music, it, it takes on another life. And I think it's, 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 it's it, I think that was one of the, the points you were trying to make, Dave, as well. It's uh, uh, lyric writing is it's its own thing. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not just poetry set to music. Uh, it can be poetic, but, uh, but it still takes a little bit of um, well, the lessons learned from, from poetry and sort of in the, the rhyme and schemes and things like that there that along. Um, just with the way, like, I think I, I was talking about there was more like a uh, more assonance coming into the, the mm. way that you were talking, well, the way you were singing as well, rather than like uh, uh, rather abrupt rhyming schemes um, mm. is that something you have in your mind when you're writing or is it just something you've done it so often now i think naturally? that's a really good question and i think there's a lot of things that do just happen naturally i think i'd be lying if i said oh yeah i'm constantly really really um conscious about making sure that this sounds these words sound good as well as looking good on a page and i'm i'm mm. i'm not always doing that consciously but i think you're completely right i think what i would say about songwriting songwriting versus poetry for me is that a song 
is a, is ephemeral, isn't it? It exists for this kind of brief moment, at least when you're just listening to it, where it's being sung, and then it kind of dissolves into nothingness um, yeah. until the next time somebody plays it. So I feel like for for that reason, song lyrics have a greater need to be instantly intelligible. So on first hearing, unlike maybe unlike a poem where you might sit and pour over a page and read something over and over again, lyrics can't be reread in the moment. So it has to, you have to be able to instantly engage with it. I think that's one thing that I think about in the way that maybe the lyrics sound. Um, the other thing is that the accompanying music or like the shape of the melody will often kind of make up for that simplicity. Yeah. Um, Think, which is uh, why it's me, it, it's when you listen to it it seems a bit more abrupt when you read it sorry it might seem a yeah, bit more abrupt uh, for, for me it's it's almost like the music's breathing life mm, into, into exactly the like the other on the other hand i feel like if you if you try if you took a poem and tried to to turn that into a lyric it might seem a little kind of gaudy like a little over the top um <laughs> because i guess that's because as a poet i'm not a poet or at least I don't think I'm a poet, but you you create the music through the words. Mm. So if you then try and add music to something that is already kind of has an innate musicality to the way that the words sound when you speak them, then that would be too much. That would be like sort of over accessorizing your outfit, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I um, poetry as well, like um, it can end up invoking imagery in your mind where with mm. the lyrics, with the song, there's a almost a different process. More mm. The other thing that I was going to... Different uh, things in to the mix. The other thing that I was going to talk about um, was uh, two complete different ends of the spectrum is, I don't know if you guys have heard of a song, very famous songwriter called Max Martin, who's a Swedish guy, and he's written loads of epically successful pop songs over the years like epically epically successful but he actually does not care about the lyrics at all his his whole thing is that he grew up um listening to elton john and the beatles and having no idea what they were talking about because he speaks swedish so his whole thing is to do with um with the syllables the number of syllables is the most important thing so it's not about the lyrics and the meaning although obviously clearly there must be something good about them, otherwise the songs wouldn't have been so successful. But his thing is that if the if the lines have the correct number of syllables, then the song will be successful. And you can sacrifice meaning for that. So that's kind of one end, complete one end of the spectrum is that um, the the lyrics are there to kind of serve the music, and that it's it's all about creating this kind of balance and this this. Um, uh, the correct number of syllables. There's like a really terrible Ariana Grande lyric that says, I only want to die alive, never by the hands of a broken heart. Don't want to hear you lie tonight now that I've become who I really am. That song is really successful. <laughs> it's a really great song. Like, I'm not going to lie. That is a great song. It's called Break Free by Ariana Grande. Go listen that, to it. It's a banger. That, that but... <laughs> But it's a ter it's a terrible lyric. But if you count the syllables, I only want to die alive, never by the hands of a it bangs. It's great. It sounds great. You're, if you don't listen to what the lyrics are saying, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. I'm feeling it. That, and then like on was, the complete, uh, <laughs> well, I, was, I was trying to get out. So like, the complete kind of other end of the spectrum. Down, and and uh, I just like say it out uh, or even try to read it as a. It doesn't make any sense, yeah. It's the complete so other end of the spectrum would be an it's artist like um, an artist like uh, Bon Iver, where arguably when you listen to the music, you actually can't understand much of what he's actually saying, but you're but but you kind of fill in the meaning yourself mm -hmm. and create this. It's what it means to you. And that's all to do with the way that the words sound rather than the meaning of them. And they sound so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the way that he kind of plays with words that sound similar to other words is, yeah, I think is is very poetic. And I would argue that that is poetry and songwriting is poetry from that perspective. So I don't know if I answered anyone's question there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You answered a lot of different ones. <laughs> yeah, you, you answered several there. I think. Uh, Karen has a question for you about simplifying. Karen, are you are you still with us? 
I am still with you. I was very hesitant in even putting this in the chat and I'm even more hesitant in actually putting it in words now. So Gwen, bear with me. There's absolutely <laughs> no criticism implied here um, because you, you said at the start, you know, you, you are writing songs in order to get an audience, sell to an audience, um, mm. get radio time. I just wonder how much of, you know, if you didn't have to do that, if you're just doing it for you, how much would you not simplify are you only simplifying for your audience? I mean, I'm just wondering whether, you know, yet again, here we are dumbing down. Mm. And I, I mean, I played in the pit orchestra for Gilbert and Sullivan, and I absolutely love those incredibly <laughs> lyrics. But, you know, you look at that then and you look at what we hear now. And I just am interested in your views on that. I think you're right. I think um, there is a sad, there is maybe a sad cynical side to it that, um, are we all just like losing our concentration span in the modern era of TikTok and et cetera? That makes me sound really grumpy and cynical, but I feel like there's definitely an element of that. However, I don't think that's always a negative thing. Kind of like what I was saying before, I think if you can distill your idea into fewer words, it's that's probably still going to be stronger than expressing it in, in, many many words unless you can do that in a way that is superior if that makes sense like i think maybe if i wasn't writing with the aim to be on to try and get a song on the radio would i make something more complex and more florid and more detailed and maybe express myself in a fuller way i mean there's certainly songs that i have written in that style but actually maybe they're the ones that I haven't ended up sticking with because for one reason or another, they just haven't worked out. So, um, hmm, is it dumbing down? I still feel no, because I do still stand by that idea that if you can express something in a kind of clear and succinct way, it's probably still going to be more powerful and emotive than maybe writing something very comp again like this is a, i feel like then you kind of get into a bit of an argument about genre because then i can name lots of i feel like somebody was writing in the chat people like Joni mitchell kate bush i mean if you think about some of those great some of those great songwriters like it is all about storytelling and detail but they still had these little grains of ideas like choruses that that hit you and and punch through and it's they have that balance that's maybe what i would get at there is that it's not necessarily all about simplifying but it's about having that balance maybe between having that detail with something that is a bit more powerful and simple i don't know i don't know if that answered the question as well ed sheeran yeah i agree ed sheeran does that a lot well, I'm sitting here thinking Cole Porter's hooks must have been pretty darn good because we're still remembering them 50, 60 years later. Let alone oh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that there's there's also a, an element of trend as well. Things will go around and come around and the the cream will always come to the top, I guess. So, um, maybe, yeah. maybe you had a good age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Graham Goldman's um, songs are, are like uh, two and a half, three minutes long, and he's written some like absolute classics, and they are very written to a framework as well. Uh, yep. You know, Seven Inch Singles in the 60s, uh, and, and they're fantastic, absolutely yes. amazing songs. So yep. um, I think having discipline of like a shorter song is good as well. Yeah, I, I, I think discipline is a is a very key word, actually. Uh, Hunter had a question for you, Gwen, about Kate Bush. Hunter, ask away. Hi. So, yeah, with Kate Bush, um, I've listened to some of her albums recently. And the thing that really jumps out at me is that even though they're classed as pop technically, um, they're very experimental. Like, sometimes she speaks, she doesn't actually sing. There's one album where the first track is 13 minutes long. It doesn't really have a structure, but um, the whole music industry doesn't really seem to care. They're just fascinated by her because she's just so unique. There's no one else like her. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I think, what do I think about Kate Bush? Um, again, this could be a cynical thing to say, but if Kate Bush 
was an artist starting out now, would she be, would she have become as successful? I would argue no. And that's just me being brutally honest about the way that the music industry has evolved and become the beast that it is today. I mean, that's not guaranteed, but you just don't have the opportunity to be that experimental now if you want to to break into that kind of pop sphere in the way that she became such a you know crazy successful pop icon in that at that moment in time it was the right moment the right thing at the right moment in time um if, you know she's obviously like she's obviously like a, a genius i'm not questioning kate bush's musical um abilities and songwriting abilities at all but it is I, th I think it is uh yeah it is very sad I don't think that had she been a, a child in I mean I don't know it's difficult because I think there's always going to be something about about that kind of young experimental mind even if you look at somebody like Billie Eilish I don't know if you can really compare Kate Bush and Billie Eilish but like insanely successful child stars they would probably be quite comparable in terms of their going slightly off uh off piste experimental style does that make sense i yeah. feel like maybe if you compare those two artists yes like um i can't even remember what your question was <laughs> <laughs> was it just what do i think about kate bush's songwriting everyone yeah you said everyone seems to talk about her songwriting as experimental yeah maybe it i mean it's interesting yeah if you could if you do compare somebody like her to somebody like billy eilish would you i mean her album starts with like somebody randomly talking and she's really successful so yeah be do you you do you that's probably what i would take away from um kate bush <laughs> You do yeah. you and see what happens. Who who knows? Like, yes, there's something to like trying to fit into the mold of three minutes and 30 seconds and making something hooky and making something, you know, standing out from the first the first second. But who knows if the thing that you do is not just going to like hit on the zeitgeist. I don't know if Billie Eilish would have ever known that the thing that she does had be, would ever like become so crazy successful and that the thing that Kate Bush did was so crazy successful at that moment in time. Yeah, I, I think you have. To, I think you have to bear in mind there's there's always an element of luck. Yeah, uh, I mean I, <laughs> I know Kate Bush had one stroke of luck in that her dad was a good friend of Dave Gilmore, which <laughs> kind of helps <laughs> in getting your demo in front of the right people. Yeah. But it's I, probably the I'm same thing for Billy uh, Eilish, I think as well. I, I, yeah, I think but the other thing, Dave, as well is that back back when I remember, I remember seeing uh, Kate Bush on the TV and hear her on the radio. Uh, there were only like, what, three three TV channels. That yeah. was what we got. And even though you might think, oh, she was quite experimental, alternative. Once yeah. you got that exposure, you know, that was, that was it. Yeah. Everything yeah. now, we've got multiple channels. You've got yeah. less chance of, of getting that like super exposure that, that you did when you were yeah. back then. Uh, you're giving yeah. it on a point. There's all of that, and and there's there's hard-nosed commercial reality. I'm I'm aware from from reading about her because I'm a, a big fan of Kate Bush. Uh, people forget her second or third albums were commercial failures and cost a fortune to produce because she built her own studio and ran up vast bills doing it. But the first album had made EMI so much money they daren't drop her. And she's now in a situation where they get an album when she feels like giving one to them. And that, there's a famous oh, story that yeah. she invited the, the record company down to her house to listen to stuff she'd been working on. Gave them cake, played them one track, decided she didn't like it and sent them away again. And about four years later, they got an album of something entirely different. Because they're, they're so commercially dependent on the income from selling Kate Bush albums that she can do that. Yeah. But most Can people you imagine couldn't. having that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, all the power. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's like uh, J.K. Rowling with her publishing company. Uh, her last book, or well, the last book of the Harry Potter series, didn't get edited. They just printed it because they were going to sell tens of millions of copies. <laughs> and yeah, that that's complete artistic power. Um, mm. 
Gwen, I, I had a very different question for you. I'm, I must go into the beeping in the background is me telling me to turn the oven off. So I'm going to do that. In a uh, it's all right. The, the dinner is out of the oven. It's not going to burn. Uh, it's not a you, you, No, 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 you're fine. Uh, you spoke about critical listening and, mm. and learning from listening, which is which is another way that's drummed into you on, on creative writing courses. Uh, how long did it take before you'd written songs that you really felt like were your voice rather than you imitating or, or plagiarizing other people? How, how long did it take to you felt like that's a Gwen song? That's a really good question. I don't really know how to answer it. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I consciously would have ever felt that something I was writing was not my own voice if that makes sense i feel like i feel like it's almost that it's the other way around that i'm constantly being influenced by different things that who i am is always changing and what my voice is is always changing i'm not sure that there ever would have been a version of me that wasn't who i felt i was at that moment in time does that make sense so like yeah. there might have been a period of time that i wrote something that, that was like really um derivative of i don't know whoever was influencing me at that in that period of my life but do i feel like i have reached a point now where i am this is my voice and my, this is my voice and this is not going to change i feel like that's difficult to say because i might go down another alleyway kind of next week and start writing something bit different and that might mm. feel like that's my authentic voice does that make sense so i yeah, kind of yeah. I, it's difficult to say i i think probably it's it's probably an easier thing to judge from the outside actually <laughs> but if, <laughs> if you if, if someone who has listened to the things that i write over the years has sort of got to the point where they think that sounds like that's a gwen song you know that <laughs> i can notice that there's a, there's something about that that she does in all of her songs or something it's probably easier for somebody else to make that judgment than for me to make that judgment because i might not necessarily be as conscious of those things but i don't know yeah I, will, I, will I, I ever reach that point i don't know <laughs> will, will you know if you have yeah i, mean, I don't yeah. know <laughs> so I, i've had two of those similar kind of things with, with feedback on writing where, where somebody pointed out to me that my writing really, really reminds them of, and then they named somebody that I'd never even heard of, let alone read. Uh, so I went away and read some and went, yeah, it does, but I can't possibly be plagiarizing Angus Wilson because I'd never heard of him. Yeah. Uh, so you get that anyway. You, know, you just ha naturally have a style that can be reminiscent of other people. I think. Mm. So. Mm. I'm, I'm looking at the time here and it's now... 25 to 9. <laughs> uh, so I think I'm going to say, does anybody else have another question for Gwen while she's still gamely and bravely answering them? <laughs> I think we're all done, my love. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank listening to me ramble on. <laughs> oh. It's been an absolute pleasure, and it, it's genuinely been an education. Uh, you're not just a, a, a great songwriter and singer and, and musician. You're a good teacher, Gwen. We're all proud of you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> maybe, I'll have another, maybe I'll have another stab at this songwriting work one yes, day. Yes, please do. I, I, and if anybody writes anything... The appropriate congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Yes, un unmute and applaud, please, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much you, for listening. Gwen. Nice to see you all. You too. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, if you go <clears throat> go to the website in a couple of weeks' time, you will find a link. If Gwen is happy with this, because uh, we've been recording it, we'll put a copy of this up online, because I can't possibly remember everything I've learned from this, so I'd love to watch it again. Uh, similarly, if you go to the, the website, if you you are interested in writing other than songwriting. Uh, we have a flash fiction workshop coming up in about a fortnight's time. Uh, we have an interview with a writer called Courtney Newland, uh, who was one of the writers on Steve McQueen's Small Axe series. Uh, 
and has also recently published a, a fascinating alt history novel, uh, a, a River Called Time, uh, which is set in a London where slavery and colonialism and the empire never happened. We have always had a harmonious, racially <coughs> equal London. What would that mean? How would that play out differently? Uh, that's coming up on the 24th of June. And then in July, uh, this isn't on the website yet, we have a poetry workshop with the wonderful Richard Scott. So plenty more for you all to come. Thank you once again to Gwen. This has been a fantastic evening. I'll let you all go and have a drink and get your supper. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Good. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>